Okay. <laughs> well, thank you all for coming back and staying for the best part of the symposium. As you know, to keep people around, we always pack the best to last, unless you were a speaker earlier in the day, and we have to make sure we keep everyone here throughout the entire thing. But no, I, I think this is a really interesting and exciting topic that we're going to be talking about today. Again, dealing with one of the um, Purdue giant leaps of securing the giant leaps in health, longevity, and quality of life. We've got four hopefully, interest, four hopefully differing perspectives to point out issues. And we, I've asked the panelists to give some brief statements for five to 10 minutes, so there's plenty of time for lively discussion, because I know myself, I prefer either when I'm on a panel or listening to one, the discussions always generate the most interesting things in people's prepared slides. But um, everyone seems to have a good perspective on what we're going to talk about. And so we'll just start by having Jim. Ralph Lexell. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say, I wanted to make sure I was getting it in the right order, Jim Ralph talk, who's the Chief Security Officer for CVS Health. Thank you very much. Uh, so I chair, or, or j actually just stepped down from the chair of the Health Information uh, uh, Sharing and Analysis Center, the ISAC. Uh, and as such, I've had a broad perspective on healthcare. Now, I'm a reform banker, I have to admit that. So uh, joined healthcare about six years ago. Uh, and I'm still kind of learning the nuances, I guess, of uh, applying cybersecurity practices to uh, healthcare. The biggest challenge uh, that healthcare as an industry face is that uh, HIPAA has a dominant uh, presence uh, throughout all of healthcare, and that's generally a good thing. HIPAA is pretty light from a security standpoint. It's primarily uh, about privacy. Uh, so when I compare it to financial services, which is a little heavier on the cyber side, uh, the biggest challenge that we as an industry face uh, in healthcare, uh, specifically healthcare providers, is that security is thought of as a compliance thing, meaning that if you comply with the regulatory requirements, all is good. Uh, and that there was a time where that was absolutely true. Um, that time was several decades ago. <laughs> it's not true at all today. And so, being compliant with regulatory requirement is a critical path, but it's not the end game, and it's not sufficient. Uh, and what that means is, if you think of the alternative, what's the alternative to a compliance-based security program? It's a risk-driven security program. Well, what is that? Well, that's studying and understanding intelligence about threat actor tactics and then changing and adjusting your controls based on that. So I work for uh, a large enterprise today. We change our controls in terms of our uh, control procedures 1.5 times a day. That's an indication of resiliency for an enterprise today. There was a time where never changing your controls was thought of as resilient. Uh, so I'll tell a story. My first day in cybersecurity, I know it was a long time ago. Please don't <laughs> rub it in. Uh, my first day in cybersecurity, I actually was a CISO. Now, I was an IT professional for a long time, uh, but that was back when the, uh, I worked for American Express. They didn't have a CISO, so they said, oh, we need a CISO. You know, uh, you do it, you know? And uh, so my first day on the job, I'm looking at my calendar, and the second day, there's this meeting with the OCC. Now, I knew enough to know that OCC is Officer of the, Contro Officer of the Controller of the Currency, right? These are, this is a heavy-duty regulator, right? The title of the meeting was a presentation of the information security strategy for American Express. That's when it dawned on me that's why I was selected as the CISO <laughs> for that point in time, because my boss, the CIO, didn't want to give that presentation. So I had 24 hours to prepare a presentation without being a cybersecurity professional. Now, fortunately, I had bumped into a guy who's a, a heavy cybersecurity guy, wrote a bunch of books named Mark Murko, and he gave me a piece of paper and he said, when you get well over your head, call this number. Now, I was pretty cocky. I looked at it and I was like, I, I'm not going to need that. I just stuck it in my pocket, never thought <laughs> another thing about it. 
until I saw that calendar entry for the OCC. I realized I was well over my head. So I immediately pulled out the number and called Steve Katz. Steve Katz was the first CISO ever uh, in, in ever, like ever, <laughs> for uh, Citibank. Uh, and he was consulting at the time, and this 20 years ago. And I called him up. I said, Steve, I got this meeting. I got to present to the OCC. I'm you know, the new CISO for American Express. He said, don't worry, I'll be right over. So I said, well, let me give you the directions, click. <laughs> well, sure enough, 45 minutes, he comes over. He comes over with two other people. He introduces me to them. They're two other CISOs from other financial service firms that compete with American Express. They dropped everything that they had to do that afternoon, and they were going to help Steve help me prepare for this presentation. So they walk in my office. One of them goes right to my workstation. Didn't have laptops back then. So it goes to my workstation and says, what's your password? <laughs> now, I'm thinking this is an initiation, right? They're testing the, the security guy, right? They said, no, you idiot. I'm doing your presentation for you. I got to get into PowerPoint so I can put it together, right? So literally, they spent an hour and a half going through all the papers on my desk in my office. You know, they, I had four different security functions. I was all bringing together into one. And they prepared the entire presentation. I did nothing. When, when I'd start to offer, well, I think that they said, shut up. <laughs> they prepared the whole thing. And then they said, OK, now you give the presentation to us. We will role play that we're the OCC. We'll pretend we're the OCC. And you give the presentation to us. So I went through and I gave the presentation. And they'd sit there and say, no, you idiot. You can't say that. You have to say this. And they were very, very prescriptive on what I had to do. <laughs> so this went on for like two or three hours. And finally, they said, OK, you're ready. And I was like, boy, and I, I was like battered by that time. I'm like, I really don't feel all that confident. They said, no, no, you're ready. Just stick to the script. The next day, I came in. I gave the presentation to the OCC. At the end of the presentation, the OCC said, I think you have a good strategy. Looks solid. We're all set. We won't see you for another year. Uh -huh. Now, just to translate, that's as good at it as it ever gets. Like that, that is like a high bar if you meet that, right? And the reason that I survived that was because they used a formula. And they used a formula that back then was the formula. You choose a risk framework. You identify control objectives in that risk framework. You align your business and IT management practices with the control objectives that are clearly in the risk framework. You get a third party to do an attestation of the efficacy of your controls against that risk framework, and you declare victory. That's what cybersecurity was 20 years ago. And it, was, it worked. Like, it was OK. Today, the boundary with conventional controls in a risk framework and what you actually need for resiliency is getting farther and farther apart. And it's why compliance to so-called industry standards is totally insufficient if you want to avoid major business impact of security incidents. So my challenge in healthcare is our challenges in healthcare. It's to move from compliance-driven security to risk-driven security. Thank you. Very much. And so now we'll turn it over to Chris Reed, who's the uh, Director of Product Cybersecurity at Eli Lilly. Yeah, so I can't agree with Jim more. And, and I think. Um, Do you want the money now? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The mic so is on. Um, just to give you an I think what I'd like to bring to this that's a little different is um, just to kind of highlight how fast healthcare is starting to change. Um, it's an industry that I think has been, hasn't really been affected as much as many other in industries by the digital innovations that have happened out there. Um, but all that's coming. And I think if you need any further evidence, it's that I sit, you know, I work for Eli Lilly, a drug company, and I'm sitting here um, building a product cybersecurity team because we're going to have a lot of digital products that sit in patients' hands and on their bodies very soon. Um, and it, to me, it's a really exciting time. The way I try to relate this is, you know, I think about the healthcare I've been through. And a lot of times it's, um, you know, when you're healthy, you might go in the doctor and get a test every few months or once a year. Um, so the medical record is literally these little spot checks of how you're doing. But there's a lot of things that happen between in those gaps. And 
with all the, uh, all the technology, all the wearables and sensors, um, and honestly, the cost of coming to a facility to even manage that, you're gonna start seeing a lot of that pushed out to the patient, to the edge. Um, and the cool part about that is we'll have a lot more data points, but the bad part about that is we'll have more integration. Um, which, so for all that, the, the, the risk management perspective, you know, it does get really difficult and simple compliance is not gonna keep all that data safe and, and make it have a lot of integrity that's gonna be used to treat people um, and make serious decisions. Um, you know, one of the things I think is interesting as well is, you know, as a pharmaceutical company, we're starting to use um, what we call digital biomarkers to look at whether or not our medicines work. So this is, if you think about even an example of a Parkinson's patient um, with some type of gyroscope device on them, you could actually see, it, is the medicine that they're taking effectively reducing the amount of tremor that they have? Um, over time. And so you're, you're going to see actual digital data, not just biologic data. I mean, it's, it's, it's representative of something that's happening, um, but a lot of that's going to be used in this space in the future. And of course, all the AI applied to all this and the big data work in the back. Um, you know, Lily specifically, and I can share this, you know, we're working on the concept of an artificial pancreas, this insulin pump that will um, by itself watch your glucose and give you lot smaller doses of insulin when you need it and act more like your actual pancreas would operate. Um, so you're gonna start seeing technology really get into a lot of sensors and data analytics to help patients um, you know, live healthier lives and hopefully increase the value that we're getting out of our healthcare. I guess to make a point about the regulatory and the risk management, um, you know, the FDA is actually, do, in my opinion, they're doing a pretty good job in this space, in the medical device world. Um, they haven't come across with a list of, here's everything you need to implement to be compliant and get your product approved. Um, but one of the things that we struggle with is how to integrate, you know, medical device companies typically are pretty good about safety risk management. Um, they're not good about risk management on cybersecurity. And so we're working hard on how do these two systems live next to each other and have an interplay. Um, but you can't just throw cybersecurity into your normal risk management process because safety will always win. And security is a lot more than just safety. We need to make sure the data um, has integrity. And obviously, you want to keep your personal information safe because there's a lot of personal data flowing through the system. Um, you know, I think, as I think further in the future too, we're gonna have a lot of interesting privacy issues around um, who pays for things. So if you think about the commercial models of how all of these services we use, how they work today, a lot of it's advertising driven and you get to use your Gmail account for free. Um, it's gonna be interesting to see what privacy we have to give up in order to fund the development of all these tools going forward. Um, and then I think lastly, and it'll probably help, uh, especially to Georgetown, uh, at the end here, talking later, one of the biggest concerns I have is we have a big legacy device problem, and I'm worried about that problem impacting the trust in all these future technologies. And we have a really almost an intractable problem in the legacy space. There's just a lot of old devices in a lot of organizations um, that are understaffed and undertrained, and we're trying to do the best through things like HISAC to tool everyone up and help them get the funding they need. but. Um, you know, you can walk into any healthcare environment and just see devices all over the place. And um, if you know anything about those devices, you, you start thinking like, oh, when's the last time that thing got patched? And, um, and what network is it connected to? And you probably don't want to ask too many of those questions right now. So, but yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an exciting space right now, um, but it is, it is very fun and complicated. Okay, well, and when you're talking about all of those digital sensors, it's a great transition to Vijay Raghunathan, who's a professor of electrical and computer engineering here at Purdue and works on embedded systems and IoT. Uh, thank you, David. Um, so I sort of bring the academic perspective to, uh, I guess, this panel. And one of the uh, benefits of being an ag academic is that I have the luxury of being able to dream up clean slate solutions, right, without being <laughs> hampered by a lot of the, uh, you know, sort of legacy baggage, if I may put it that way. Right. Uh, and um, so we, my, uh, I lead a team of uh, sort of very bright students and researchers, some of whom are in the room here, uh, 
who over the past 10 years or so have been looking at essentially clean slate approaches uh, for hardware and software architectures for next generation embedded systems and uh, you know, the medical device area, right? And we're talking about wearable medical devices and more uh, sort of of late, of even more interest, implantable medical devices, right? Things that actually go inside your body. Um, and ways, in, ways to design these systems to make them uh, more energy efficient and secure. Right? Um, and there's a number of uh, sort of specific systems that we've, uh, that we've looked at and worked on, including sort of the artificial pancreas Mm -hmm. uh, sort of system uh, where we've um, sort of tried to design a bunch of what we call uh, last lines of defense into the endpoint of the medical device itself, such that uh, you know if even if there is some kind of a security attack or there is some kind of a malfunction in the device, uh, you know can we put in sufficient safeguards uh, and make those safeguards you know sort of, uh, well locked down. Um, and small enough that they could be sort of verified statically, could be you know, sort of verified using formal methods, for example, where we can actually prove that, look, you know, under these set of assumptions, these, these devices will actually do, uh, you know, perform the way they're expected to perform, or if there is a security attack of a particular kind, right, you can actually say something intelligent about uh, you know, what the device is basically going to be doing, and if you can sort of lock down the device to prevent any, any, any damage. Um, and so my take on uh, sort of based on that line of work is I think uh, implantables, you know, looking forward, you know, 15 or 20 years, I think implantables are going to play a very, very key role in this whole space of, uh, of medical devices. I think it's sort of continuing that trend of pushing sort of healthcare down to the patient and down, in fact, into the patient right, in the case of an implantable. And I think that lets us do two things, right? One is it lets you sort of get a you know at least in most cases uh, a lot of real time feedback right so you're sort of closing that loop in real time as something happens to a patient you know if a patient you know has an you know sort of an epileptic seizure or a patient has a heart attack or something right you know the the, the loop gets closed much faster right and the second is uh, it allows us to move towards a realm of uh, personalized medicine right and again as uh, chris mentioned uh, you know that aspect of personalization, right? You know, you want to be able to figure out if a particular drug is working well for a specific patient or not, right? And sort of that aspect of personalization really comes to the forefront if you uh, now start thinking of all of these wearable and implantable medical devices, you know, sort of providing you personalized real-time feedback. Um, the challenge with a lot of these devices in terms of security, as I'm sure uh, my co-panelists will, uh, will, will attest to as well, is the fact that, uh, you know, it's one thing trying to design a large cyber cyber system and trying to secure that, right? Uh, as complex and as difficult as it is, but you also these systems also have the compute resources, the sort of architectural safeguards uh, in place that, as a security engineer or a person who's worrying about the security of these systems, you at least have the tools that you can use in order to enforce security policies and stuff. Uh, the issue with a lot of these implantable medical devices is that they're, you know, clearly for mostly for energy consumption reasons or for uh, sort of form factor reasons. Uh, they lack a lot, at least the hardware components in there lack a lot of the architectural safety mechanisms that we are typically used to when we think about security in uh, conventional types of computing systems, right? And that makes it a real challenge uh, in terms of actually trying to secure these devices, right? And can Often, even something as simple as, you know, you put something into a patient, you put a pacemaker into a patient, um, and uh, you somehow want to securely communicate with it, right? This thing is going to be wirelessly enabled. Uh, how do you exchange keys with an implanted device in a secure manner, right? In sort of in a, in a scalable way, right? Uh, and not do something crazy as having sort of a preset key that you're going to use for the same key for all the other devices and stuff, right? So that's one aspect. And the last uh, uh, sort of challenge that I'll... Uh, that I'll mention in my opening remarks here is uh, security in these implantable devices is also sort of a, uh, it's a, it's a double-edged sword, right? Because under normal conditions, imagine again a patient, for example, who has a pacemaker. Under normal conditions, you want to lock down this patient pacemaker as much as you can, right? You don't want 
anybody talking to it except perhaps you know sort of in a very secure way a device that a user owns or of course if you enter a secure environment like a doctor's office like a, a cardiologist's office and they wave that magic wand over your uh, over your heart um, but the instant something goes wrong with you the instant you have a heart attack and you know you call 911 and that emergency responder shows up you want all your safeguards to basically just vanish because you don't want to impede access uh, you know access to your device and access to care Right, in any kind of way, and you don't want to have that emergency res responder even delay by a few minutes or a couple of minutes trying to actually get into your device. Right? So it's this really strange thing. And by the way, that emergency responder will probably use some kind of a special device to talk to your, to your implantable medical device, which, and these two devices have never seen each other, they've never, never had a chance to sort of exchange keys before or, or uh, sort of calibrate with each other, right? So it's this really strange problem where you really want your device locked down, except when you don't, in which case you need to <laughs> So sort of just throw it open completely, right? And uh, sort of solving that dichotomy, I think, is one of the most interesting uh, sort of challenges and you know things that uh, you know, that people can work on. Right? I'll stop with that. And pass along to George. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> and our last speaker is George Bailey, who's a senior advisor for health IT security with Purdue Healthcare Advisors. Thank you, Professor Ebert. So I come from a different perspective. I'm a security practitioner who has the benefit of actually working with delivery health systems, doctors, nurses, IT practitioners in health systems of all sizes, down to your one doc, three employee clinic, all the way up to multi-hospital health systems. And I get to see the whole gamut of good practice, <coughs> bad practice, and, and everywhere in between. And, and, and I'll concur with these three gentlemen, right? HIPAA, I think, is, is very misunderstood, right? So. As an industry, we're being promoted for interoperability. We want data sharing because we want to get data in the patient's hands so that as they bounce around to the various care providers, they have the data that they need to get optimal care. However, providers who are under this regulatory constraint of, well, can I share with that other care provider? Can I, um, how do I do so securely, right? So HIPAA allows it. Because it's so misunderstood, people err on the side of caution, and it, it inhibits care. Uh, I mean, there are things we can do securely to, to enable the patient, for sure. So I think HIPAA needs some significant rewrites, right? Think about when HIPAA was established, right? It was uh, enforceable early 2000s. It was written in 1996 as part of a, a health insurance uh, uh, modernization. Right? So security was a byproduct of HIPAA. But because of it, we have now had two decades of facilities and healthcare delivery systems just not understanding how to implement it. And you know, the way that I describe it is healthcare today is in their dot-com boom, where most of us back in the early 90s, late 90s, adopting public-facing systems, right? those first DMZs you rolled out because you had services you want to give to the public, Healthcare is just now in that space. And we wouldn't be in that space if it wasn't for some incentives, at least US based healthcare <coughs> facilities. Right? Since 2011, healthcare facilities have been incentivized to adopt electronic health records and to deploy patient portals and to get information in the hands of the patient. Right? So we, we've had these organizations that were purely paper based, pen and paper, very next week. Oh my goodness, we have an electronical system. We're, you know, we have computers everywhere. And we don't have a formal risk management strategy to deal with IT issues. You know, we, do, we do handle compliance, OSHA, infectious disease, those kinds of issues fairly well in healthcare. But managing the security of data and systems, those processes, although other industries have, have gotten very good at it, we don't have the personnel in healthcare to address that. Most security officers in that medium size health system and smaller, their security officer is probably their HIM, their health information management person. Right? They were the person who managed the chart room. Right? They, they were charged with keeping patient privacy. And now, oh, well, you dealt with data, you dealt with information, wear this other hat. And the reality is they're only wearing that hat whenever Health and Human Services pays them a call or their payer wants to know how they're securing data. Right? They don't have the luxury of wearing that security hat every day, every hour that they're in their facility. And then worrying about it, right? You ask an HIM person what keeps them up at night, 
It's not data security because they're, they're just not informed enough to know that. So you know, these poor risk management strategies, which is required by HIPAA, but it's not prescriptive. HIPAA will say, look to NIST. Use the NIST uh, 853 for controls on how you would protect your systems. Look at 830 for how you would assess uh, your IT environment. You give that type of framework to a, a person who's used to managing paper files, and, and it's, it doesn't get implemented. That, not to their fault, they just don't understand it, and they don't have the resources to go and, and get it uh, figured out. So these risk management practices leads to poor technology life cycles. So as, as Chris mentioned, right, the FDA is providing decent guidance, and, and medical device manufacturers are, are implementing. Right, They understand. They've heard the consumers. People were afraid when Dick Cheney turned off his, his pacemaker right, that that was world news. And, and was he paranoid? Probably not. He's a high-profile person. He travels internationally. Right? If he was a target and someone got close enough to him, their potential vulnerability, there certainly is a threat there. Right? Someone like myself, low risk. But it's the, it's the legacy devices that really we have the issue because in most care facilities, if it's not a revenue generating, right? so you hear the commercials on the radio, get your heart scan, $49.99. Right? That's a revenue generating service. At the end of the day, your doctor is running a business. Right? So to keep his doors open, they need to have revenue. So if they have an $8,000 EKG machine that they bought 20 years ago, and the function of it hasn't changed, it's a diagnostic device, doesn't really make them any money, they're not going to upgrade it. But it is networked. It is, um, networks aren't segmented. So if you, you're in the clinic, and, and you have access to the network, that device is vulnerable to, you know, to anything else that may be vulnerable from that state, that age of the device. Uh, so it's a, it's a big thing, and, and eventually that will organically solve itself. Uh, these devices break down as they do turn over, but it's going to be a long time. So a couple other things, uh, just the, the situation of awareness of the vulnerability threat landscape. Healthcare providers are in the business to provide care. Right. They, they're not in the business to be up on the latest, um, wh whatever the latest vulnerability might be. Right. So a couple of years ago when we were dealing with heart bleed and poodle, these SSL uh, issues, uh, SSL is one of those things that we should have solved a long time ago. Right. We shouldn't be using SSL version, any SSL versions. Right. We should be on TLS version 1.2. I see SSL version 2 everywhere, right? Because our healthcare folks, they're IT consumers. We've, we've programmed them to look for the padlock, right? So in their EHR system, in their patient portals, they see a padlock. Oh, it's secure. They don't understand that there's, there's levels of security there, and they don't know that they should be reaching out for the most modern, right? And that, that goes through all layers of, of the system. Uh, other talking points, uh, security awareness of all levels, right? So you've got folks that are your senior executives of the healthcare system all the way down to that medical assistant, right? And the medical assistant's touching the patient. They're interfacing with infusion pumps. They're, they're, they're interfacing with the Pixis in order to dispense meds for the, for the RN. There's, there's all kinds of things that they're interacting with and they have no awareness of anomalies, right? So if they see a message on the screen, they click through it if, if there's, oh, it's time to reboot, right? So things like ransomware is why healthcare is, is, is so vulnerable to those things because people in, in the industry just, they don't know to stop. And they, you know, we, we're telling folks to have a zero trust, but they don't know not to trust. Um, um, physical security, it's, it's not necessarily a cyber issue, but uh, because we have legacy devices, Windows XP is still very prevalent, at least here in the Midwest, in healthcare delivery systems. Uh, I would imagine it's, it's prevalent everywhere. <laughs> um, and why is that? Because there's, a, there's a, a mobile ultrasound machine that plugs into it and, it, and it's purely because the driver only works on XP. And in order to retool that, it's a turnkey solution and I gotta spend another $100,000 for whatever the latest and greatest. And the latest and greatest doesn't give you any more diagnostic capability within that whatever test that device is for, so they live with it.
but it's on the network. They access the EHR, they print, they do other things. Um, so, and the, the physical aspect of that, you, you could walk up, you could touch these things as a patient. You could walk them, touch these things as a, as a representative of a patient. And there's not a lot of scrutiny when you're walking through a healthcare facility, right? You, if, if you want to do harm, a hospital is where you need to go because most people aren't going to question you, right? They're busy, they're overloaded, and you can, you can, touch, you can touch a PC, you can touch a Pixis machine, uh, a med dispensing, uh, you can touch medical devices, and you know, something as simple as a rubber ducky, right? A, a key, keystroke injector device, you can, you can have a, cause a lot of damage. Uh, other talking points, uh, I think, um, I'll leave it that, we'll, we'll leave that for questions. Okay. Well, I, you know, I was thinking of this in my terms of where we're going with the change in medicine and the change in new implanted devices and personalized medicine and all of the new security concerns in that and not thinking as much about the legacy systems and the integrated patient health exchanges of information and the privacy of all of that. And so personally, I, things that I just consider normal cyber problems or information security or information privacy, seeing the way that they're getting transformed today from that individual small device up through, you know, citywide, statewide health information exchanges is um, a little <coughs> illuminating and a little disconcerting as well. Uh, it's one of those things where when you were talking about what people are pulling up on their systems, uh, twice now recently seeing a physician, he Googled a term and then pulled up pages um, off of Wikipedia to explain what was going on on this terminal with my medical records and, you know, my entire personal health record there on the same device. And I have no idea how secure that is, but you're just thinking of, you know, he thought nothing of it. And he said, you know, did your rash look exactly like this? And it was like, well, yes, it did. Um, so, you know, these things where I think you're right, you bring that human in. I think there's also, you know, these emerging challenges as you talked about in terms of the um, with the implantable devices and in terms of there's some interesting work colleagues are doing here at Purdue and actually using the bioelectric field of the human as an identifier of who can access that device to control that device. So you're using your personalized electrical field to make sure that you don't have someone spoofing it. So there's really creative solutions to some of that. But then when you get into the sharing of information, and you know, CVS being an example that is also now pro providing prescription plans as well as being the person who's selling the drugs. And so now you've got more information collected uniformly and sort of, I guess, for privacy side, the good or bad of our healthcare system now is most of your healthcare data is fragmented, and so it's very hard for anyone to really get your life history of your medical history because some of it are with the drug companies, some of it with the different providers you've seen over the years, et cetera. And you know, if you have more of a system like in Canada, provincially you've got all of the data sitting in one place, which opens up potential for more accurate healthcare which is one trade-off versus the vulnerabilities that that gets. So I think there's a whole range of questions for that we can talk about here. And so please step up to the mic and um, address those. And as, well, as we're waiting for someone to come up, I guess you know the one question I pose to the panel is, what are you most concerned about in looking at um, security of the future of your personal health care? Uh, so I'll give it a shot. So there's a trend that has some intoxicating attributes to it, which is cloud computing. <laughs> and the intoxicating attributes is that you can store data in one place, use it for hundreds of different purposes with different entities using that data. Now, that's the promise. And the economics to that equation are what's intoxicating, because instead of storing data 100 times, you're storing data once and you're using and sharing it with all sorts of different entities that could be competing with each other in certain cases, uh, but have very different needs, but need access to that data, right? So there's two uh, approaches that give us some hope for uh, being able to realize that and protect the data effectively in all scenarios. One is called differential privacy, which is 
it's an obfuscation, and I'm going to butcher this in the interest of time, an obfuscation technique that basically allows you to get multiple people to access the same data without sharing data from a compliance standpoint. Um, so that's one dimension. The other is homomorphic encryption, which al allows you to offer <clears throat> an encryption capability uh, on the data that's served up as well as the queries that go in simultaneously. So if different competitors are using the same database, neither one knows what the other's doing, and they're only seeing the data that they're uh, entitled to, to see. So you combine those two um, trains of technology deployment, development, uh, evolution, uh, and now you have the promise, potentially, of storing data once in the cloud and using it for multiple purposes, including consumer purposes uh, at, with lots of different entities. Um, it's still relatively new, um, but this is a perfect example of where HIPAA gives us guidance today that says, if you de-identify the data, you can share it with multiple entities. All right, let's just assume that one of those entities that you share it with has a wealth of consumer data at their disposal and a number of data scientists with uh, pretty decent tools at their disposal. What that means is you share de-identified data. It doesn't know that part of the data element says Jim, you know, in that. And you share that with the, the, the entity, and they can identify it very easily. Uh, using the data science techniques and the data that they already have. The, from a HIPAA perspective, this is cool. This is okay. This is, this is compliant. From a risk standpoint, not so much, right? And by the way, there is no answer for this from a compliance standpoint. And um, uh, I think you pointed out, what was it, uh, George, you pointed out uh, HIPAA started in 1996, 96. 96, right? Took a long time, right, to iterate. So the legislative process around healthcare, is that an efficient process? <laughs> Don't answer that, that's a rhetorical question, right? So it's gonna be a long time before regulations solve for this. So we as practitioners have to use risk uh, and our concepts of risk to solve for this. And that means designing controls that don't necessarily exist today uh, to be able to solve this problem because technology marches ahead. Anyone else want to say something, or should we take another question? I think we should take uh, the Go the ahead. So uh, <clears throat> uh, as working for a DOD contractor, <clears throat> I see a lot of similarities between, you know, what I'm hearing here and what, what we face as well. I mean, uh, you know, there's no profit in cybersecurity, right? It's, you're protecting against something. You're hoping to limit... Uh, uh, a future event that may happen, so uh, uh, it, it's difficult to sell, right? And we're, we're all up against the same problems that, that George described, uh, limited, you know, limited resources to a, a task, the tsunami that's hitting us, right? So, but, and Jim, so you described essentially what is, what we use in DOD, the risk management framework is what you used, right? But and and we're getting further away from being able to <clears throat> uh, usefully apply that to get resilience, right? So, <clears throat> but what what? And I think you just started to describe what my question is. What what's the next steps? What are the next steps to narrow that gap or to uh, start to uh, y you know reduce the risk? Yeah. So the genie's out of the bottle. We're not going to narrow it. So that's not in the cards, but there is hope um, because there actually is profit in cybersecurity. Um, they're unique examples, but the, but it is there. So, for example, I implemented something um, called uh, uh, DKIM and SPF. You're probably all familiar with, and DMARC is the uh, standard. Is anybody familiar? With so we're talking about email, so, uh, basically trusted email. DMARC basically in, uh, prevents any entity from spoofing a domain, which used to be a common technique for phishing attacks. And um, in my case, I implemented it. About 40% of our email volume dropped, most of it coming from uh, Russia and Eastern Europe. Uh, and the volume that dropped was basically pharmaceutical spammers that were 
uh, selling, uh, you know, uh, products to our members through email. And so when we dropped all that traffic, the uh, click-through rate on our email campaigns, and about two billion emails a year, uh, uh, went up 10% every year. And this has been going on for the last four years. So what that means is our email campaigns <clears throat> are driving people to have healthier behaviors, and that drives profit to the company. So we put a security control in place, and it increased profit for the company. So that's one example where profit can drive. There are other examples for if any uh, large enterprise b builds software uh, and spend a lot of money to build software, if you build software and get somewhere between 20 and 30 percent improvement in productivity in the development hours and building the software, well, then you build software at a lower cost. So that also will drive profit. You can also take the productivity gain and invest it in new functionality or capability. That also drives profit. So from an economic standpoint, never try to sell software security because it's lower risk. That's a, you'll never win that argument because it's, there's no way to attribute defects in software security to an enterprise because the consumers that get hosed when they browse a website and get infected with uh, malware that's on the, the, the uh, software, you know, in terms of the vulnerability, they never know that it's your website that it does. They find out six months later when the fraud hits. They have no idea. There's no attribution whatsoever. So there's no incentive for an enterprise to have quality software. But there is economic incentive uh, in terms of improving your productivity for building the software and harvesting that benefit any way you wish. But that's economic dollars and cents. So in most security uh, cases, um, it, it actually, uh, there's an economic argument to implementing security controls. The variable is you have to look at the total cost of IT ownership, and total cost includes the patching and vulnerability management, which is often not captured anywhere on a balance sheet for any enterprise. But that's actually where um, the, the value is. So if you look at the total cost of IT ownership, <clears throat> I can influence, and, I, and I'll, I've said this publicly, I'll say it again, I have no problem getting money for cybersecurity. I never have. I get as much money as I want for whatever programs and projects that I want. I know that sounds like that's counter to conventional wisdom. I'm telling you, <clears throat> I've worked for big companies. I, I never have a problem because I use the economic benefits. Now, there are some security things that it's difficult to do that. I grant you that. But the majority, 70% of information security controls are in the delivery of IT. So if you change and alter the delivery of IT to be more effective, and most enterprises that are large spend a lot of money on IT, and that's cost savings that you can use to invest. So the economics and the profit motive actually is alive and well. Uh, you have to be a little bit more creative on how you do it, but um, that's what I do, and I encourage everyone to do that. Does that help? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I, I can't agree more. I mean, I think you have to have that a little bit of business acumen to, to help deliver, help the, bus, the business understand what that risk is, but how taking an approach is going to help bring some money back to the table for them. And I, I'd say what I try to do a lot of times is I'm looking for opportunities. The reality is we have, and this is where I think it comes into risk management, um, we have more problems than we can solve on any given day. But I try to match, like, what are our biggest risks with where do I see where we can move a business process forward? So your example of making things more efficient, um, a lot of the big terms that you'll hear today in agile development with continuous integration, um, hey, you should implement continu continuous integration in your software development process. And by the way, when you do that, I'm going to plug in all these security tools, and the developers can't move to the next phase until they close things out. Um, you start to show them advantages and efficiencies, but at the same time, you're getting controls built in there, and everyone is coming out better on the other side. So there is a savviness, I think, to get security done well. Um, so it, I think it is getting hard, because you can't just say, hey, this is an awful problem. Um, we have to solve it. Um, that's not going to ever get you funding, or very rarely, unless it's just obvious. So um, I would just emphasize that. I think that's really important. Great. Yeah. The one thing that I will add to that again, sort of from the perspective of somebody just uh, building technology, is uh, I think even though sec that security can often be an enabler for 
uh, you know, new usage models or new use cases, right? For example, if one were to solve the security problem of, you know, how do I securely, you know, sort of bootstrap a medical, implantable medical device from my own smartphone, right? Uh, that could, and, you know, I think that potentially drives a very powerful message that, hey, it now enables users, potential users, to keep track of their own implantable medical devices and their status and their operation of those in real time. And that could potentially drive up adoption rates, right, of people using these technologies. So security, I think, could also play the role of an enabler, sort of indirectly driving the economic side. But I do agree with them that it is the economics which 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 will have to be, uh, you know, sort of the driver front and center. Now, can you continue that discussion? Uh, cybersecurity can be a competitive advantage, right? but it has to be linked to reimbursement. Right? Telemedicine, we can do a lot serving disparate populations of sick people with telemedicine. But if providers can't be reimbursed for that encounter, they're not going to invest in the proper cybersecurity to protect that telemedicine session. Right? So it goes back to, uh, again, if it, if it can't generate revenue, the, the small to medium-sized delivery system is not going to be able to invest in it. Next question. Hey. Thanks for all y'all for coming. I had a kind of a broad question and a more context specific question. The broader one being, I've worked in healthcare a number of years myself uh, and seen a lot of the problems that a lot of you discussed, like even in some of the bigger hospitals that implement more security protocols, like a doctor has to have their token on them. They usually leave it on their badge, but then they say, hey nurse, I need this file, go get that for me. And then, or a nurse may leave their, their token that they leave uh, on their badge at the nursing station, which is open, and you could just reach over the counter and grab it if you really wanted to. Uh, a number of other ones being like the monitor in a doctor's office facing the window. You could very easily look at personal health care information. So like with all of these types of little examples, um, I wanted the, the panel's thoughts on solutions potentially being, do we want to focus on uh, training our current healthcare personnel, giving them another workload of learn a new you know, uh, privacy protocol, try and implement it into what you already know and you've done for 30 years, or do we want to focus more on uh, having the new blood in cybersecurity have a more focused, context-specific view of healthcare or whatever vertical they're going to work in, like oil manufacturing or something? Yeah, so it's either or is what you're suggesting? <laughs> Those are possible solutions, yeah. but do either of those sound good? Well, a couple good? things. First of all, if we could just get rid of all the people in healthcare, security would be fine. <laughs> no problem. Flawless. No problem. Okay, that's not likely. Um, so maybe we ought to be training or teaching people um, a little bit more effectively in terms of security awareness. Um, but what we've done historically for the last uh, couple of decades is we teach people of the risks of cybersecurity. It's it's uh, totally insufficient. First of all, today, most media outlets do a better job of it than any enterprise or provider would do. Um, just read the paper. I mean, there's always, that you can't pick up a paper today without reading about cybersecurity. It's in mainstream today. It's made it, if you will. What's not in there is a focus on the techniques that you as a consumer need to understand as a, as a professional <clears throat> and as an individual, as a, you know, in terms of your personal needs. Um, and there's kind of a blending in terms of, you know, smartphones that cross the, the gamut there. Mm. Um, but we have to teach people how to be better consumers. And here's, uh, and, and what does that mean? Here, here's a couple of examples. If you use a digital platform that you don't pay for, it means someone else is paying for it. So you're not the consumer even though you are made to feel like you're the consumer for Gmail, as an example. Who's the consumer or who's the buyer? The buyer who's funding that is funding that because of the information you provide into the system. You're not the consumer, the digital consumer, you're the product. Or more specifically, information about you is the product, and therefore, you're the product manager. So if you think about being the product manager, you've got a fighting chance for making decisions on which platforms to use. If you're paying a lot of money for a platform, I'm just using an Apple iPhone as an icon here, 
because uh, <laughs> I think it's a lot of money. And if I use iCloud to back that up, there's a lot of money that I'm spending for that. But your information is much better protected because you're the actual consumer. But when you use a digital platform that somebody else is paying for, and you're the product. And so you've got to act like a product manager, which is deciding what the trade-off value to use an individual is to give up your information. And, and if you think about giving up your information in that context, you've got a fighting chance. Um, how to be a digital consumer and have some level of protection in what you do. Um, but that, does anybody hear that message? I mean, you know, unfortunately, because <laughs> we're the, I mean, the platform owner, the platform owners aren't telling us this because they got a pretty good game going right now, right? So uh, it's up to us to, to figure this out. Yeah, the way, the way we think about it a lot is, and the way I've, I've thought about it for a number of years is, you've got to teach users how to know when they're walking down a dark alley um, because no amount of controls are ever going to stop that intuitive sense of something's not right here. I need to slow down and pay attention and have my guard up, right? So telling a user yeah. that there are dark alleys, insufficient. Yeah. Telling a user how to walk down a dark Absolutely. alley or how to choose yep. which one, Yeah. priceless. So, so that's where we focus a lot of our efforts. Um, but I agree totally. You, you've got to also make these things easier for them, make it easier to see the dark alley. You know, even things like tagging email in a certain way when we think it's suspicious, just to you know, and obviously getting a lot of that out with DMARC and things like that is, you've got to take the workload off the user because they're everyone's trying to get their jobs done, and um, yeah, it, it's got to be both. Unfortunately, that answer your question. Sure. <laughs> The more context-specific question, with the advent of like wearable health technologies like the artificial pancreas, like yep. even more simple insulin pumps that have a lot of sensitive personal health care data, um, the move and from a security view, uh, will that maybe a solution to securing that data would be maybe encryption in the device or having some secure means of storing it at a hospital, but then that could potentially get into the area of, do we want to open data centers in hospitals, huge data centers where they're already having a lot of funding issues the way, with the way it is, and then we need to potentially hire more personnel to, uh, with the cybersecurity focus, to manage those data centers. Like, what, what kind of ideas uh, okay. does the panel I mean, have about that? I'll start, first of all, I think, this is where I was saying, I think the FDA is doing a pretty good job. They have a draft guidance out there that got released in October, and if there was any doubt of whether or not you're supposed to encrypt data at rest, <laughs> it's it's gone. Um, they, you know, not only do they say to do that kind of thing. I mean, they they talk about um, cryptographically verifying the software that's running, um, you know, on the device and things like that. So I I really applauded them for. It's not a checklist, and there's some there's some work to do. It was a draft guidance that's gonna that's getting reworked right now, um, but I feel like, you, you know. There's no doubt all these devices are going to have to solve these problems. But just like Vijay mentioned, um, it is difficult, though, because of some of the, you know, we want a device that's going to operate for a week without recharging. How many people's phones operate for a week without recharging, right? <laughs> but you don't want to have to recharge your, you know, hey, I'm, I'm going away for three days. i got to remember to charge my insulin pump. I mean, you know, we've got to come up with ways to um, manage the, the cost, not just money, but um, computation and things like that on these. And then as far as, the, you know, the integration of all these environments is definitely going to be an interesting area, like as it comes up. I, I definitely don't think anyone's going to expect a hospital provider to build data centers. That's, that's not going to happen. Um, but I think you're going to see da data start to get layered, like where there's like the primary EHR system, but then there's hey, they use this type of device, and so I can go get all the details of that, and it's stored somewhere else. And, and it'll get um, abstracted from the, the physician. Um, but we can't expect, like, um, if we're generating a gigabyte of data per hour per user, that a hospital is going to be able to, you know, take in all that data. Like it, so there's going to have to be really strong integration and strategy on how to do that. To go back to Jim's comment, I think in a scenario like that, will be the product. The patient will be the product. The device manufacturers will de-identify de the data. Mm -hmm. And, right, so if my device gave me a boost of insulin, right, it knows, it knows what my body was doing prior, during and after treatment, 
right? That data can inform researchers and make the device better. Yep. Um, all policy issues, privacy issues aside, right? So I don't think it'll be the delivery system, the healthcare provider having to manage that data, uh, but someone will. Right. If I could tell you a trend that's driving a lot of this right now that I think is really good is um, it's the outcome-based payment. So uh, a lot of, you know, you hear even in the media, we're, we're big insulin manufacturer. Price of insulin is a big topic even in Congress right now and all that. Um, there is a drive to a model where outcome will be what pays. So if someone's, gluc if, if someone's blood sugar is managed in range, you get paid this, this amount. Um, if it's not, you basically maybe get covered just for the cost of the product, but no profit, right? Um, that, that, that's starting to shift in the background, but we need a lot of these data systems in order to actually show that. Um, so to me, that's a really exciting trend, but we still have a lot of work to do. But I, I'm hoping that that, so hopefully it shifts a little bit from the product, um, but it does, it does the, the motivations become still like, hey, we're getting good outcomes and we have the data we need to do that, and that's actually what's funding a lot of the, the research and keeping things up to speed. Okay, sure. I my, think that's a positive development. Yeah. My 15 second addendum to that will just be that uh, when you're talking about a lot of these devices, you know, wearable devices or implantable devices, I think uh, security ends up being a whole lot more than just cryptography and the data, yep. because the security, the attack model, or the attack surface is just so broad and so diverse. Right? I don't have to do, and I don't even need, need your data, right? I, but all I need to do is to just drain the battery on your system, right? as yep. you sort of Chris was mentioning. And that does not need me to actually even read a single piece of information from you. I can just keep transmitting data to you and just keep, keep your radio on and just let you burn your battery out. Right? So a lot of the security attacks can be you know, sort of non-cryptographic and stuff. And so the solutions also will have to be, I think, sort of uniquely tailored and out of the box to address some of these unconventional uh, sort of non-cyber security attacks, perhaps. Okay. Great. Thanks. Great. Let's take one more question so we have time for a short break before the final session. Okay, so going back to this problem of like the wearable devices, so what do you think about the issue of you send these devices out and there's a, like a vulnerability found in these and some of these systems may be very hard to patch, like the user might not know what they're doing or like pretty much impossible with like an artificial pancreas where it's literally in your body so it's really hard to like patch it. So what do, you, what do you think about that issue? How do you think we're gonna solve that issue going forward? Well, you say it's hard. It doesn't mean we, we have the option not to do it. Um, I've, I was gonna give the example earlier about how you get security controls worked in. And every time I brought up how are we gonna update this right. out in the field, I, everyone looked at me like, we can't do that. Um, but I managed to tie it to other priorities that we had for the program. Um, like updating our algorithms that run on it safely and things like that. Um, and all of a sudden it became, they saw that was the solution and it, it, it totally got funded and supported and, and taken through. Um, I do think there will be devices, it, it, it's gonna depend on the safety impact. Some devices won't be updated and um, th th there's still gonna be an interesting problem in that space, but we're gonna have to, I mean, if you look at the FDA guidance and their expectations, you have to be able to update these devices in the field. That isn't, it's not gonna get through FDA approval um, coming into the future without that capability um, and that you've done it well. Which kind of makes sense because it's software. Yep. <laughs> but who are we fooling? Software is never perfect, <laughs> never. Right? Software always has to be patched. So. If we're putting software in devices, hey, you got to patch it. That's there's the, you know because some vulnerabilities we discover years after the software's released. Absolutely, um, you got to be able to patch it. I mean that's the way software works. Um, I think it works that way with planes now. I think that uh, West Coast <laughs> companies wrestling with that. Is that right? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I think, right. Software update, right? I think there's no question that we'll have to update these devices. The, what scares me is how. Yep. Right. So these these devices are going to be in you or on you. Mm -hmm. So how are they gonna be updated? It, it, Bluetooth, personal device, will it be a dedicated device that comes coupled with the device? Not likely, right, because that, that increases the expense. They're gonna use a device that you already have in your possession, right? So you're going to make a very <coughs> sensitive, very trusted transaction to update your pacemaker on an Android device that's five years old, way behind on its updates and patches. Do you trust that device? You trust your pacemaker, 
because maybe it's been verified cryptographically and, and, and with formal methods. But do you trust the Android device that you're using to communicate with your pacemaker? Right? So consumers probably aren't going to know. But, but certainly device manufacturers will have to take those ecosystems in, in mind when they're developing these patch routines. So. You don't want to have the way, to I think take it in for a recall. Yeah. yeah. Right. Right. And I think, again, from my vantage point, this is a really interesting space from a research perspective, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, sort of, for example, some of my students are looking at specifically something that, uh, George, you just mentioned, which is, uh, you know, how do I interact with an implantable device from an external device that I don't trust, right? And, you know, perhaps there's a health server that I trust, uh, but if I, in order to get to that health server, I need to go through this Android device, which is five years old, and unpatch. And uh, is there some way that I can actually talk without trusting this intermediate party, right? And that, that's a really interesting, uh, uh, you know, sort of research question, right? And uh, sort of hopefully something that we'll get a handle on uh, sort of very soon. Do you have a short question, short question. or, or short. short answers, anyway? <laughs> we'll, we'll keep them short. So uh, it's interesting what you said about uh, how to sell security. Um, well, how about selling it from the standpoint of resilience, some availability? So we know that every system will be hacked. Uh, you know, so this, you can't prevent it. Eventually, it will be hacked. But how about uh, building in some redundancy so that the system hack system will continue to operate and deliver it uh, that may be another uh, angle which may be easier to easier to sell. Well, yeah, all those all those failure modes will have to be looked at. Yeah. Um, sometimes it's redundancy. Sometimes it's failing to a safe state. Um, a lot of that is is definitely considered and will be expected. There's not really. This is where the risk management gets really important. Is there's no. There's no list that's going to make it right for the device that you're working on. Like this, you have to really do a lot of, um, and the FDA is again push this a lot of threat modeling to understand what your surface, attack surfaces are and how you respond to those and how you fail safely. Right. Um, I, there's not really a simple answer to that. <laughs> we need more research in this space for sure. I do agree. I think the availability angle is sort of could potentially be a differentiator, right? You know, mm -hmm. you're going to be yeah. offering a better. Uh, you know, sort of SLA or service level agreement to somebody saying that your system is going to be up sort of with, a, with, a, with a higher percentage of time, that could potentially be a, a way of convincing yeah. them to spend more money. You have a mated pair of uh, pacemakers in your, in your heart. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yep. yeah, sounds far fetched, but yes, something like that. <laughs> I'll take a slightly pessimistic approach. <laughs> Resiliency and redundancy is, is absolutely key, but in your lower maturity organizations, Right, when a system fails open or it fails over to a redundant node, um, they don't have the monitoring in place to know that it switched over. So from an incident or a compromise detection mode, sometimes that hard failure, although it's, it's hard to deal with, is, is their indicator that something bad has happened. Let's call someone who can fix this. Um, so certainly in implantable devices, resiliency and redundancy is, is absolutely key because yeah. you, failure is not an option. Right, Correct. but with, with traditional network systems, uh, I, I for anything smaller than like a 600 employee health system, it would be problematic. Okay, thanks a lot. Great. Well, let's thank our panel for a lively discussion.